Okay, this next one is my, my baby. Um, uh, this has been my thing for years. I've been talking about it for years. Uh, uh, and it looks like we're actually <laughs> we're getting there. Uh, and it's really exciting. Uh, so so uh, this is talking about IPLD WASM. The, the previous talk was all about like, okay, how we're using IPLD WASM in the FVM. This is talking more about like, okay, how do we build decentralized systems and decentralized protocols with IPLD WASM um, and, and why? So the, the frustration I have here, uh, or I've, I've always had with, with really everything we do here is like, okay, I build a protocol um, uh, and I'm not happy with it, so I'm gonna build another one. Uh, it's the, four, it's a, the 14 standards problem or the 15 standards problem. Um, where like, like someone, someone builds something and like it, it's not gonna work for you because you need to build another one. Uh, so wonderful, it, the wonderful thing would be fewer standards, stop making standards. <laughs> that doesn't work. Like, I, I, like we've seen it, it's just not gonna happen. People are not gonna stop making standards because they, can, they need new things. We can't just say no more standards. Uh, instead we need or interoperable standards. We need standards where like I can make a new standard but it can still work with your standard and they can actually like, they can work together in some way. Uh, this is obviously rather hard uh, because this means you need some kind of interoperable standard standard. Uh, uh, and that is both hard to define and then maybe other people will want to define other interoperable standard standards. Uh, so you need to define the, uh, like the most basic primitive standard 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 for interoperability, um, which gets hard. Uh, so, but really what you need is decentralized interoperable standards. So the problem with even like interoperable standards, you still need to get them people to agree on how your things interoperate. What I really want here is the ability to like say, okay, I see your systems. I want to make a new system that interoperates with all your systems and you don't have to do anything. You don't even have any say in what I'm doing here. I can just make my system interoperate with yours. That's the, the, like the golden standard here. That's what I want. Um, uh, so like this is, this is not like, two parties agree, or like make their own set systems and agree, hey, we want our systems to work together to find a way to bridge them. This is, I see your system, I built the system, how do I make a new version that is slightly better that actually like works system and not just like it takes your data, but also gives you data. Like I can go both ways. This is what's really required. Like basically like I need to be able to make a new in, it's a messaging system. They could both send and receive. Matrix tries this, but it's like very much, and like they have to like, like make a bridge for every single network. Um, uh, but, but yeah, that's the kind of thing I'm looking for here. So, but to, to sort of like walk back a bit, uh, right now we're very much in the world of data, uh, where every standards are built around data. Uh, and we have protocols, but protocols are just data, just data on the wire. Um, the problem is we must agree on uh, um, formats, semantics, um, like how do we actually like send this data around? What does the data mean? When do I send a message on a protocol? All this kind of stuff. Uh, this just means like we have to agree on like teeny tiny little details that we shouldn't have to touch. Uh, the next step up from this really is data plus code, which is why this, uh, this talk is titled IPLD plus WASM, um, uh, because like, what I want to be able to do is have data or IPLD uh, and attach some code ideally in, or formatted in IPLD or stored in, in IPLD. Um, and then instead of having you just like try to understand my data, you just take my code and you call method on the code uh, and that just works. Now I'm gonna get into some specifics here on, on how to make this work or like the, why, why I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, but that's the general idea. So let's talk, let's talk about like current protocols and how they currently work. Uh, currently, uh, uh, we, we have to agree on what the protocol uh, needs to do. Uh, we need to then like agree on the, the methods and uh, messages that need to be supported. So this is graph sync where I need to be able to retrieve FTP blocks. Okay, I need to support uh, requesting data, responding, all this kind of stuff. I need to agree on how I specify the data I want. So when I be in graph sync, we have these things called selectors that specify what I want. Uh, and there's this entire language, and if you build this entire selector engine to run this thing, uh, we have to agree on, on the, the um, selector execution order, uh, how they're validated, all the teeny tiny little details of this protocol, and everyone has to do it the same way, otherwise things break. Uh, whenever I need to upgrade something or change something, I need to go back through all these steps and redo everything uh, and get everyone to, to actually agree on this and then do the thing. Um, and if I'm some random third party, forget it. Like I can't just make this change. This is a very big frustration for a lot of our users. We're like, I wanted this change. And, but we say, well, this doesn't really fit with the, with the use case or this code is not perfect or it's not the direction we want to go or whatever. Uh, but they, they need the feature. And right now we kind of have to say, well, for the greater good, we're not going to accept your feature. Ideally, they would just make it a feature. Uh, but protocols after, once you can start shipping around code, um, uh, then uh, we can just start by agreeing on what the protocol needs to do. It needs to retrieve IPLD blocks. Then we agree in the interface, where in this case, like a, a graph sync interface is basically 
I define a block store interface. Um, uh, it has a get method. It returns the block and whether or not it has the block. Um, uh, and then I define a stream interface where I can just write bytes, read bytes, close the, the connection. Um, uh, and that's basically the protocol. Where now basically I just send you a program. Uh, uh, you pass an object to this program that implements the interface. Really, you implement host functions in Wasm that implements this interface. Uh, now I can just start reading blocks out of your block store. And I can just start writing bytes back to a stream that goes back to me. Now, we have to agree on how to activate the stream, but that's a very low level like, detail of like, OK, we need at least some kind of stream protocol here. Uh, but we don't have to agree on the actual like, like the protocol that runs on top of the stream at all. You just send me back bytes uh, that I've specified in my program, and then I know how to interpret it because I wrote the program. Uh, but this means like, if I want to change a select just work, I need to support the format. I, I want to send back, like, I don't want the entire DAG. I just want some cryptographic proof that you did the right thing. I can do all this stuff. It's also a lot easier to secure uh, because like with selectors and graphsing and stuff like that, it's very difficult to figure out, okay, how long would this runtime take? Like, what is the complexity of this thing? Like, um, how much memory will it use and stuff like that? And we have a lot of, like, ton of complicated logic trying to make this work properly uh, and trying to make it somewhat secure so that someone can't just DOS your node. With, with um, uh, Wasm, it's actually like you basically just, you spin up your Wasm VM, you set your limits, you set your timeouts, uh, and you just let it run, and then you stop it if it isn't complete. Uh, which means you have this nice little sandbox where you can enforce your your, your rules. Uh, where in in traditional protocols, like you don't generally have that nice little sandbox where you can enforce your rules. So you have to enforce them all over the place and it gets really complicated. Um, and then on upgrade, you don't have to do anything. I just make a new version of my query and I send it to you. Now, of course, the problem here is if I have to send you a megabyte request each time, that's big. But this is where IPLD comes in. Uh, because if I can take my code and shove it in IPLD, and chunk it in, in the right way, so at least it tries to re reuse some of the code, because quite often when you compile things in, um, in Wasm, it'll actually compress well because it reuses a fair amount of stuff. Um, uh, then like, I can actually create an actually DAG where like, okay, if you don't have, like basically I tell you about the code, I tell you the CID, if you don't have it, then you fetch it from me over GraphSync or BitSwap or whatever, or maybe I push it to you. Um, uh, but then once you have it, you don't need to fetch it again. Uh, you can just run it because you already have it. Uh, because, and you, you can know that you already have it because like it's, it's, IPLD, it's all content addressed. That's really what content addressing gives you and also what the duplication gives you. Where like, if you have a protocol that almost says what I need, I can take that, in many cases, reuse many of the components um, and then just send you the new pieces that I have uh, that I need. That, like, this is not easy. Uh, this means like con basically content-based chunking of code, which we have not actually solved. Uh, but that's kind of the next step in making this just, like, just work. Um, another example I like to give is file types. So before in the, in the current world, uh, uh, we have to agree on the behaviors, so read, write, link, stat, all this kind of stuff. Uh, or for documents, I need to understand, I need to agree on the fact that we have to re we need to be able to render these documents somewhere. Um, or for in virtual worlds, we need to agree on, on the fact that, like, okay, we need to be able to render these objects in 3D and interact with them and stuff like that. Uh, uh, then we actually need to agree on the details, like the, how do we encode it, what are the semantics, like, what, like, all, like all the, the stuff here. Um, we're like, like we, HTML is massive spec, PDF is, I don't want to talk about it. Um, uh, and like it's not great. Um, and then we have to agree, agree on how they're supposed to be displayed and all this kind of stuff. And no one will uh, actually agree on this. Like all, no input should work the same, so everyone will get different outcomes. And then again, on upgrade, we have to get everyone to move forward. And I can't use a feature until I convince you to upgrade your code. I can't like include some new thing in my document or some new piece of my website before I can convince like Chrome and Firefox and whatever to, to upgrade. And unfortunately, that means that everyone just uses Chrome. Uh, and basically, browsers tend to standardize around one implementation because that means that like you just target this one thing, everyone uses the one thing, and you can move really, really fast. And this is not decentralized, it is very centralized. After, uh, we can agree on what it needs to support, and that's it. Basically, we just agree, okay, read, write, link, stat, whatever. These are the set of interfaces. Uh, uh, as long as it supports this, uh, great. It's not easy, like we still have to figure out how to paint the shed, we have to figure out the interface we need to support, but once we've done that, then we can tweak the file formats, we can tweak the data structures, we can optimize for a specific use case, do anything we need to do. Um, and on upgrade, if I want to switch to a new file system, I can just do that. And then basically whenever I, 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 um, I create a, like a new object, now I can send you a link to both the code and the object. This is actually getting into something else that I didn't talk about before, um, where like uh, in IPLD, we've talked this many times, we, we would really like this concept of fat pointers. But like right now I can send you a, C, a pointer to a piece of code, um, or sorry, to an object, a piece of data. Uh, in the future, we like at least I would very much like the ability to send you a fat pointer. That's a pointer, some code for understanding some, some data, and then the data itself. Um, uh, this way you sort of like, you basically create this type tree and data tree, um, and you, you smush them together by creating this big, this wide pointer. 
uh, and then you basically apply the code to the data to understand the data. Uh, so this is where I really like to go. Problem here, obviously, is that uh, these CADs could get very large. Uh, so the, like, an alternative proposal is to uh, put the code CID inside the data, um, or to create like sort of like a, 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 a sort of a, an object uh, that points to the code in the data, and then you point it out with a separate CID. Um, this, on one hand, this, this does make the CIDs much smaller. On the other hand, it means need to download this extra object, so some trade-offs here, but that's not too important. But this is not enough. Uh, so the problem here is um, we have to agree on the interfaces, and agreeing on interfaces is really, really hard. Uh, so like at least we don't have to agree on on the exact implementation details, but we still need to agree that what is a, like what is a file? How do I want to do this? Uh, uh, we may be able to get away with not agreeing on naming by using numbers and saying names are implementation specific, um, uh, but we at least need to agree on like like what types of arguments you want, what are the semantics, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so. Really, we need data plus code plus interfaces and lenses. Uh, so lenses is a concept of like, basically like when you have some data in some format, I can then view it as something else. This can also apply to code. There may be a more specific term, but I just call it lenses, where like if, I, if you have an interface in one, or one interface, I can then create another interface and then create a sort of interface transform that makes your interface look like my interface. Um, uh, so once we can start doing things like this, then we can even stop agreeing on interfaces. So example here is um, uh, WinFS and UnixFS, and I'm sorry, that should have been, should have been um, WNFS, not WINFS. That's probably gonna confuse a lot of people because it's not Windows, but I made these slides quickly. Uh, yeah, but the idea is like, for example, let's say I have UnixFS and you have um, uh, a, or sorry, I, I want UnixFS, I expect UnixFS, but I have a WinFS file. Like someone's given me a WinFS file. Um, how do I understand this? There are a couple ways we can do this. One. Um, uh, WinFS, like the, 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 the author of the WinFS, WinFS system or the, of this file could have specified in the, the data type here or in the code, uh, WinFS implements UnixFS via some WASM code. So that's sort of a lens going from WinFS to uh, UnixFS specified by the WinFS type or the WinFS code. It can also go the other way around where like if I'm expecting UnixFS, my UnixFS type locally can specify that anything that implements WinFS implements UnixFS via this lens. So then like if I get some WinFS object, I can then view it as UnixFS because like my local implementation says that. You can also do this with a third party um, uh, where like, let's say I don't care about either. Like actually this is a third case where I want FooFS, some other file system. Uh, uh, I can then create my new interface because I like my interface and I don't like yours. I, I wanna paint my shed purple. Um, uh, I guess in this case red. Uh, so I wanna paint my shed red. I have a purple shed and I have a teal shed. Uh, what I do here with, uh, and I, so for my red shed, um, I say, well, uh, my red shed is implemented by uh, the purple shed, WinFS, via some WASM code, and is implemented by UnixFS via this other WASM code. Uh, so now, like, if you give me any of these types of objects, I can just understand it in my program uh, via these lenses. Uh, so now you can create this, like, what I like to call, um, well, sorry, the, the previous system was linear development, where everyone has to, like, sort of, like, uh, agree on the interfaces. I call this decentralized development, uh, where like uh, you can make your spec and your interfaces and to figure out how you want to make things work. Someone else can independently make a different file system um, uh, that has a different interface. And then I can come together and say, wait a minute, those are basically the same thing. Let me implement a, or a new interface and then specify in my interface how your interfaces implement my interface or really how, how your types implement my type. Uh, uh, now in my system, I can just use my type. If someone else wants to use both of yours, why bother? Like they could just use mine and they will automatically get access to all of your data. Um, and then you can sort of keep doing this. So you can keep sort of basically forking and joining and forking and joining where like multiple parties can take mine and say, I want to extend it. I want to add a new function. And they can do that and say that basically my, uh, my system is or uh, implements their system via some lens uh, and is implemented by uh, their system via some lens. So they can go both ways basically um, uh, and add some additional function or whatever functionality they want. Someone else uh, can do the same thing over here, and then a final party can come in and basically link those two, new, those two systems together and say, well, they're actually basically the same. It is how they're basically the same. Uh, so my dream here really is to not have to like get everyone to agree on this stuff. Instead, just be able to say, look, just add the feature you want, attach it to your data, not someone else's data, it'll be attached to your data, um, use it in your program, uh, and then if people like it, they'll adopt it. If they don't like it, they won't adopt it, but no one actually has to like agree up front. And the thing that makes this work is content address code because it can just ship it around. 
uh, uh, and I don't have to like worry about where it really lives. I, I can deal with duplication and stuff like that. And the fact that it's all running in WebAssembly, it's all sandboxed, so I can just run untrusted code. Uh, and the fact that also the, the data is content addressed. Um, that is the uh, general idea here. Uh, I really, really hope to see more systems that try to implement this kind of stuff. Um, I'm really excited because, uh, I mean, this past week, I've been seeing a lot of systems that are getting closer and closer and closer. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it's, 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 not a, it's not an easy problem. Uh, the last time I sat down to try to solve this problem, I got lost in uh, Lambda Calculus land um, because you have to actually decide like what is the base type? Because this is all very abstract, like okay, I have these interfaces and whatever, but what is an interface? What is the base type? And like, I came to like, well, really a function is. <laughs> um, uh, and that, that can be very difficult. So like, the hardest part here is like agreeing on, as I was saying before, like what is the standard standard standard, like the ultimate standard? Um, we've actually, like, some of side, we have agreed on that in many other cases, which is called uh, multi-codec. That is currently our standard, 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 where like, you can't agree on anything, you at least agree on the magic number, and then you try to agree on the next thing. Uh, but here, like, it's still tricky. Questions? Does that make any sense? Yes? This is the last standard, right? <laughs> uh, ideally, but not necessarily. So like, if you do this right, well, Yes, like you still need to agree on, on some code thing. Um, but like, so sort of, basically like someone could make a new system like this. Uh, it would not be backwards compatible, but it would be, well, sorry, it would be backwards compatible, not forwards compatible. So like you could make a new system that would be able to understand the old system because basically any system should be more general than the old system if it supports code. Uh, but you would not, the old system might not understand the new system because it, well, it doesn't. Yep. Have you looked at, uh, like, I think there's, I bet you look at a bunch of things, mm -hmm. like this idea of moving around code to the data instead of moving the data around. Yep. Uh, this exists in like a bunch of areas. I mean, Java has been yep. to it. Um, recently, I found Unison quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the programming language, I don't know whether you're like, aware of it. I, yes, th that's, yeah, so m moving the code to the data is, is useful. It's not quite what I'm trying to get at here, though. So, like, I'm trying to, like, this is more like little bits of code with lots of data. Um, uh, and, well, I'll explain this. This is more about trying to understand data with code and less about trying to do computations. Uh, if you need to do computations, yes, then yeah, you need to move the code to the data. Um, uh, but this is not quite that. This is more about just trying to get, basically, I'm trying to get rid of file types uh, because I'm tired of having to, like, have a billion different programs and, like, I want some new feature and you don't have it. Uh, but yeah. Also, another thing, uh, I feel like those interfaces map very nicely to mm -hmm. applications, mm -hmm. because like applications care about the interface. Mm -hmm. And just, I find it super funny that like it's literally an application of the function. Uh, which yes. Is, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. and it, the, my other motivation here really is actually VR. Um, and, uh, and I don't know what we're calling them now. We're not calling them the M word, uh, but those kinds of worlds. Uh, I, yeah, uh, we're, we're like, like, that's why I, I mentioned like renderable and also like like uh, the 3D object where like you can actually now with something like this, I can make some type that implements several different interfaces uh, where it says like I am an object uh, via this interface or I can be viewed as a document via this interface or I can be viewed as this thing via this interface. So you can kind of like, you really do get full on objects as kind of like, at least in my opinion, the ultimate object oriented programming. Uh, uh, with all of its problems in terms of performance, but you don't like usually make like this is for bigger size uh, objects where like you're not doing teen, tons of teeny tiny little objects. Instead, you have like bigger components. 